Boomer coming to you live for the Bill Ford Tough Studio. Boomer Esiason, Greg Giannotti, it's Boomer and Geo on the fans, simulcast across the country on CBS Sports Network and wherever you are in the free Odyssey app. Good Tuesday morning. Boomer was down at Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final last night down in uh, Sunrise, Florida. He was there on the ice. I don't know if anybody saw him while watching the game, but he was right there. Uh, behind uh, the goaltenders, he would switch both sides, so he was right there behind the Florida goaltender, Bobrovsky. So uh, he was celebrating. I don't know if he was rooting for the Panthers or not, but there are there's video of him out there in the locker room holding the Stanley <laughs> Cup with the Florida Panthers. So I know he was desperate to be here today and talk about that game, but unfortunately he's not. So it's our loss that we're not going to be able to break that one down uh, with Boomer, but we do have a Subway series to get ready for. Now we got Jerry Recco back. Good morning, Jerry. How are you? Gee, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing well. How was your trip out to Scottsdale? I uh, couldn't have been better. Honestly, nice. start to finish as good a trip as we've had. Last year, if you remember, when we went to Texas, we uh, had a flight canceled. That's right. The day before, yeah. and then they put us on a uh, connecting flight the next day, which cost us the entire first day. This was, from start to finish, as good as can be expected. And you have come back more tan than me, and I'm a little bit jealous. Yeah, well, I mean, it was uh, 100 degrees and sunny every day. So, <laughs> yeah. And I will tell you, cooler there than here. What do you mean? It's Not cool even... this morning. It's 70 oh, degrees no, 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 this morning. No. Today, for sure. But yeah. I meant on the woman at the golf club on Friday was laughing at me. What do you mean? When she's like, because we were there Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we played there. Thursday was the only day of the four where it was really warm. Um, Friday was, I think it was 100. But, you know, she goes, oh, you guys are back. I'm like, yeah, we're back a whole weekend. She goes, oh, where are you from? I told her Jersey. She starts laughing. Her sister was from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. She goes, well, you're the first people that have come to Arizona to es escape the heat. Of New Jersey, and so she had known about the uh, the ninety seven degrees and all yeah, that humidity crap and, and the uh, whole thing. Yeah. But it was great; it really was. It was fat. The golf was great. The pace of play was great. The resort was great, and the travel was easy. Oh, How about that? Yes, isn't that the best? Yeah, I, let me, everything's on time. You don't have to stress about anything. All we do is complain about things. Let me just for one second applaud. Everything in Terminal A at Newark Airport, which mm. is brand new, yeah, and ran so efficient. I was blown away how efficiently it was run, both going and coming back. I got to say, I've only flown out of Newark a couple of times, and every time I have, it's been seamless that's for whatever good. reason. Now, weather has a lot to do with that, but uh, but yeah, that's great, man. Well, it's it's good to have you back. Is that the only vacation that you have now? You're locked in for the rest of the summer? No. We've got a baseball trip coming up, a okay. tournament trip, so it's a sort of vacation, and then uh, we'll have another trip coming up at the end of July, and then that's it. August, you guys are basically, you vanish. Yeah, So I'm true. here in August, and uh, away yeah. we go. Well, I got a big trip. We got uh, Gina's 40th birthday trip in August, so. You know, I'll be uh, gone out of the country for a little mm -hmm. bit. Yes, you will. But uh, so I'm excited for that. It's amazing how quick this stuff. Like next week is July it's, 4th. Dude, I, trust me. And then you look at the calendar. And if you've got a lot of stuff on the calendar, it's like, wait a minute. Week one of the NFL is right after that. <laughs> it's crazy. It really is. I mean, June, we've been chopping through June. Like, it's so fast. And mm -hmm. it's basically over at this point. But... We've got a very interesting Subway series, and yes, I actually mean that. It's an interesting Subway series because of the way these two teams are trending and what has gone on over the last couple of days. Obviously, the Mets playing better baseball than the Yankees right now in this moment, and the Yankees facing some adversity injury-wise with John Carlos Stanton being out for a month, maybe longer than a month. And the Mets a little bit of adversity with Edwin Diaz being out 10 days with the sticky stuff suspension. But you've got a pitching matchups here. And I know that Garrett Cole is on a pitch count and they're being careful with him. But you've got pitching matchups here. They're in, in major favor of the Yankees if Luis Heel comes out and looks like himself again. So I still expect, I still expect this to be probably I'm leaning more Yankees in this series. But if there's any chance of the Mets to gain more momentum and continue to build. This is the perfect team at the perfect time to do it. And we understand these are just regular season games. They don't mean more. The fans are into it. We're always going to be into it, even though this has been going on now for almost, what, 30 years, the Subway Series, 27 years of the Subway Series. But the Mets are on this trajectory where they're getting back into it. They're getting back into the conversation and if they won both against the Yankees, then at that point, and get back to 500 because they're two games under, 
then I think you start taking the Mets seriously again. Well, I mean, I've started taking them seriously just from the standpoint of the way they've played the game. They've hit the ball. They've pitched well. They've closed games out. The Diaz thing is a punch in the face for sure for the next 10 days. Um, And then when you look at the standings and you look at, you know, you look at the loss column, you know, 39. Right now, if you look at the the loss column, they're third in the wild card race. I know they're a game and a half out because they haven't played a couple of games. They got games in hand. But they've played really good. What is it, 13-4 and four in their last 17 um, here in June? It's amazing. It really is amazing if you go back one month, just one month, to where these two teams were going. And, and again, this can change like that, and the Mets can – would you be stunned if I told you the Mets lost their next five games? No, of and course, I, 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 would, I would expect that more so than them winning their next five games. So but. you just don't know. But I agree with you. These two games and, – and the 75 pitch thing from Cole – I don't like the quote that's out there in terms of, uh, you know, he's not all the way back. Last time I checked, 75 pitches for a guy like Garrett Cole should be good enough to get you through six innings. Yeah. If Garrett Cole went out there and threw, you know, two-hit ball for six innings and turned over a 3 nothing lead to the bullpen, I think you'd have some pretty good juice and you feel good about it. That quote kind of stinks, but... That having been said, the pitching matchup is in the Yankees' favor, I would think, over the next couple of days. Um, but the two teams have a different feel right now. And this is where if the Mets came out, I think either way for both teams, to be quite fair, a split's fine. And if either team won both, um, things would be much better in their favor. But um, I I just think for the Mets catching the Yankees right now, they have an opportunity to continue to build on what they've done. Because the one thing they really haven't done over this stretch of games, I don't know if you agree or not, is the teams they've played have been okay. They've beaten who they have to beat. Chicago's okay. I'm not saying they're not. But they haven't done well against the Dodgers. They haven't done well against Cleveland when they had an opportunity. I'd like to see them go out there and and give the Yankees a fight. And conversely, the Yankees need to right themselves. Yeah, and the Yankees, this is something that's been well documented, don't have a a great record against some of the better teams in baseball either. Um, But this this has been a slow climb. It's something we said yesterday. It's amazing how well the Mets have played in June. They still have the best record in baseball in June. And they're still two games under five hundred. So... That's how hard it is to climb back when you dig yourself that deep of a hole early on in the season in April and May. So it, it's one thing to get back to 500. It's another thing to get back to 500. Do it in a in a calendar month and then also get back by sweeping the Yankees at home in the Subway Series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this would go a long way in doing it. And I am I, I, I sit here today still not a believer. I have not been converted back into a believer. I said that once they dip below 500, we wouldn't see it again. So I'm getting very, very close to being wrong on that. But this this may be, even though the Subway Series gets overblown for what it is, this this is one of those, not quite midseason, but turning points for the Mets where if they end up splitting, it'll be fine. But if they lose two and then drop two of four, Games under 500 and the lose two to the Yankees and the Edwin Diaz suspension. You feel like crap about him again. Or, I mean, this is a huge pendulum swing back to 500 uh, and beating them. But then we'll probably get a split and then we won't have any answers. Maybe we'll not. Just keep tr- uh, trugging along to the end of the season. I do agree with you, though. The ne- I would say their next 10 to 12 games is their season from this standpoint. I- I've always thought, I- and, you know, who's right, who's wrong, whatever. We'll find out at the end of the year. But... I've always believed this is a 500 team. They ain't great. They ain't terrible. They're a middling team. And I thought if they would play that type of baseball, then we would see what the owner would do at the trade deadline. If they were a bad team and weren't playing well like they were, there's no doubt that they're going to sit there and start selling off pieces. This next 10 to 12 days, I would think for the the Mets, is going to tell us a lot in the direction they take the rest of the season. Are we going to put more money in? Are we going to look to add or are we going to start the tear down in terms of continuing to uh, build up the farm system and looking more towards the future? Are we trading Pete Alonso to see what we can get back for him? Will we try to make other moves in terms of shedding salary and payroll? Or are we going to add pay- payroll and, and players? That, to me, it's not the net in these next two games, although very important. I think the next week to two weeks will tell you everything you need to know. And that's, I think, where our fundamental disagreement on this team comes from, is you think that if they're within striking distance, that Steve Cohen and David Stearns are going to go out and improve the team because David Stearns is is he's here. He wants to have a winning team. And in his first year, Steve Cohen is someone who wants to win, is desperate to win, has the resources to win. But he's been saying for a better part of a year now 
that this season was a rebuild season, and they they have shown that with the moves that they have made. So to me, they've got to be significantly in the hunt and playing great baseball for them to add. And even if they do add, I think it'll be minor ads because the two ways that you add at the trade deadline is you take on salary or you trade prospects. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Steve Cohen and David Stearns are interested in doing either one of those things at this point in the rebuild. And this is something that is clearly in the heads of the players. And I know you're on vacation. I don't expect you to have listened to the Francisco Lindor, Scott Van Pelt uh, interview as Scott Van Pelt, but a big theme so far this morning, <laughs> not the warm up showing here, uh, but it was after Sunday night baseball and Scott Van Pelt interviewed Francisco Lindor and in Francisco Lindor, not prompted. He was just asked about the optimism for the rest of the team mentioned the trade deadline. He goes, we just have to keep playing Keep being optimistic, 27 outs every single day, and then we'll see what management wants to do at the trade yeah. deadline. So that's in the clubhouse. And Boomer seems well, to think that, that that was something that was said during that team meeting. Like, you guys like playing with each other? You want to be around? Because mm-hmm. they're this close to blowing this entire thing up. Well, I heard, I didn't see that, but I saw the Brandon Nimmo comments from last week talking about how we like Pete Alonzo, we need Pete Alonzo, yeah. we know what's coming up, if we want him here. I saw Harrison Bader talking about the the trade deadline. So it is, there's no question that's permeated throughout the uh, the, the, uh, clubhouse. I agree with your premise on giving up prospects for sure. I do disagree with the idea of taking on a free, not a free, a soon-to-be free agent, and I don't know what the list is, but in terms of a guy that's on a contract year or maybe has a year and a half left, I don't think that they wouldn't make a move because of that if, if they believe you can make a run at something. Right now, they're a game and a half out of the third wild card spot and would be third in the loss column. So they are relevant right now. They have to continue to show it. Unfortunately, if you're a Met fan right now and you like this team, on June 25th, you're not relevant enough. You know, you're not close enough to the trade deadline. You have to be in this realm right now around the trade deadline and believe that your team can make a little bit of a run. The Diamondbacks did it last year. The Phillies a couple of years ago. There is example after example after example. Um, And I do think that they would put more money into this team. I I just feel like Steve Cohen, while, yes, rebuilding, he has also said numerous times he believes this is a playoff team. Well, you got to go prove it then. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely said that publicly, but he also thought he was sending a DM to some whatever podcast or Met blog or something when he wrote that thing on, on X where he said, Essentially, you know, there's nothing we could do about blowing up this team until the trade deadline. And that's when they were going really, really bad at that point. Maybe has a different opinion on it now. But but don't you think that they've blown it up to uh, enough to the point where, I mean, they've brought in, a, they, they've made trades and brought in a lot of young talent. And we, yeah. are, I play a lot of the clips from the, yeah. the C- Syracuse teams and, and all sorts of things like that. I think they've started to do a really good job of starting to build things back up. When you look at this team, like, Alonzo's an interesting one because me personally, I wouldn't trade him and I wouldn't do anything with him. I would let him play out the season. And it's a little different to me than John Tavares. A lot of people use that as an example because I don't think Pete Alonzo grew up a Braves fan or whatever team you want to. I think he wants to be here, whereas Tavares did, but was also a childhood Maple Leafs fan. What would you give Pete Alonzo? Like, if a team came out and offered Pete Alonzo $40 million a year, I'd say, see ya. Like, yeah, of I course. I wouldn't even think about well, resigning I mean, him at that price. And, then, and I, I said to Boomer the other day, if there's one thing I could look into the future and know, if I could be a fly on the wall, it'd be how badly does David Stearns want to keep Pete Alonzo? Like, what is his limit? And there were rumors out there about, I think, Joel Sherman and John Heyman put out some numbers in the contract that he had turned down. So is that like the the term and the and the money that they were willing to go to? Like how much further than that would they go? And that's the thing that I want to know because or how many years as well? You gotta remember he's in his early thirties sure. at this point. Is there a team crazy enough to because they desperately want Pete Alonso to give him eight, nine years like the Aaron Judge contract, maybe not as much money, but but as much term because it's Scott Boris and I Ain't just, happening. Yeah, I mean, I, Ain't that, happening. But that's what. That, but this is what it always seems to happen, though. It always seems like a desperate team out there ends up overpaying somebody. But then again, there's many examples of guys in their 30s who end up waiting around and never I, get that contract signed. I mean, one J.D. Year Martinez, deal. while older, I understand that. Yeah. signed at the end of spring training. 
Blake Snell couldn't get a sniff. Yeah. Jordan Montgomery couldn't get yeah. a sniff. Now, what do they? those two guys have in common? The agent. Boris, Boris clients. Yeah. Right. Who Alonzo has gone to. And I'll tell you this. I'm not, Listen, he could hit 50 home runs from this point forward and hit 75 this year. Not happening, of course. My point is, given what he has done so far this year, and you look at the offer, if indeed that was made, yeah, that's about right. Five years, 125, given what he has done, to me that's actually an overpay yeah. because he's been very disappointing this season. Yeah, I, I still think so. Last year it was, uh, and I had this written down, but then I, I in my notes section, but then deleted the other day. I was doing some cleaning up of my phone the other day, Jerry. I had to mm. get some stuff out there. So when the when the Mets made the trade, when they traded away David Robertson last year, so it was like June twenty fifth, somewhere around there, where it was like, uh, or no, July twenty fifth. Sorry, because the trade deadline was like August first. Mm-hmm. So it was like a week before the trade deadline. It was July twenty fifth. They were seven games under five hundred and four and a half out of a wild card. If they're in that same position, four and a half out, seven games under five hundred. Oh, it's trading. hundred percent trading. Absolutely trading. How much better do they need to be than that to go for it? I think you have to I think it's the eye test. Do you look like a playoff mm-hmm. team? Don't you look like a playoff team? All right. I would say seven games under five hundred. You're not going anywhere. You're not a playoff team. I think they've done a very good job getting back to where they're at. And I think if they hover here, if you're within a a game of 500 and you are within a game or two of that wild card spot, and if you like what you're seeing, you know, the one thing about when they were losing games too, how many games did the bullpen blow? You know, the lineup, when the lineup would be anemic, they'd pitch well. When they would pitch well, they wouldn't hit, and which is the mark of a bad team for sure, a very average team. Now they've seemed to have put it together. Does this Diaz thing now crush them? Can they not close games out? Do they go tonight up 4-3 on the Yankees and whoever that Drew Smith goes out there and blows chunks and the Yankees (laughs) win, you know, 7-4? I I think you have to see it more so than just look at the numbers. And remember, though, the the clubhouse was not happy when that that happened. I mean, and and Max Scherzer's a jerk, but he said it. He goes, oh, you know, and all of a sudden we just, you know, traded our closer. So... I also think, you know, they were coming off a big year the previous year. They were saying, we've got all this talent in this clubhouse. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could turn it on. So they were surprised at that point that that trade was made when they were that bad. So I wonder what the mentality is going to be as they get closer and closer. But there remains to be seen. I think these some of these tough questions, they answer themselves, yeah. don't they? Next couple of weeks, we'll know. They answer themselves. All right, Boomer and Gio with Jerry in for Boomer this morning. CeeLo's got an update in just a couple of minutes.